Yes, uh, only to add what, what, what Peter said, I'm, I'm still an uh, 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 employee of the MFA, but currently on the temporary leave uh, for two years, which enables me to continue with, uh, uh, on several projects and uh, uh, working on those issues that are kind of interesting for me and, and, and collaboration uh, with uh, Prague Civil S uh, Prague. Uh, Security Studies uh, Institute is one of those activities um, that I like most. Um, why I have chosen this topic uh, for today's lecture? Um, you know that this year, as the year of uh, of NATO anniversary, anniversary of uh, of NATO as such, and also anniversary of uh, uh, Czech. Uh, uh, and other Central European uh, countries joining NATO. So uh, you had uh, really several uh, discussions and, 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 and seminars and conferences, myself uh, uh, moderating a couple of them. And uh, there was always a uh, discussion uh, about uh, 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 opportunities and challenges uh, uh, for NATO and also in um, uh, basic uh, security and defense uh, 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 strategies of, of states, you will find a lot of uh, about uh, new uh, strategic environment, change of the strategic environment and so on and so forth. Uh, in my understanding, uh, the strategic environment uh, in which NATO operates is not given only by uh, the, uh, let's say, character of uh, international uh, and security situation or uh, emerging threats, but uh, the phenomenon that I have chosen, uh, that means that you have now uh, uh, a really, uh, uh, let's say, uh, gap uh, uh, in the doctrines between the United States and European allies is also uh, another phenomenon that uh, uh, shape very much the uh, strategic environment for NATO. And this phenomenon, in my understanding, uh, uh, provides uh, uh, opportunity but also challenge for, for NATO uh, as such. Uh, why doctrine is important uh, is um, that uh, in my understanding, uh, it is, uh, doctrine is, is not only about uh, providing you guidance for uh, development of your own forces or readiness of your state, but uh, uh, it's also, uh, it is uh, an efficient manner uh, by which you can uh, transmit messages to the adversary. So by the content of your doctrine documents, you send a message and it can uh, have also sort of a deterrence role. Therefore, uh, I think it is very, uh, very important to uh, uh, elaborate uh, on this, uh, on this uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, in, because um, no doubt about that, in, in my understanding, uh, the future of the aliens as uh, to big extent also dependent on its uh, maintaining its relevance for the United States. Uh, um, whether you like it or not. Um, okay, so um, I have uh, chosen a couple of items that are uh, relevant to this uh, topic of the uh, growing uh, doctrinal gap. First, what I mean by, uh, by the new American doctrine. Uh, United States uh, uh, adopted a new security strategy uh, that was published uh, end of 2017. New security strategy uh, is worked out by the uh, executive branch of the uh, US administration is signed by the president and it is uh, about also uh, the purpose also to inform uh, the Congress. And um, another document that I count to the uh, American doctrine 
I'm not sure whether I have it here on, on the slide, but uh, apart from national security strategy, you have national defense strategy published in 2018. A nation defense strategy is prepared by uh, 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 Department of Defense, uh, so Ministry of Defense, Minister of Defense signed uh, this document. And I also count uh, to it uh, 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 nuclear posture review from the same year. So I have the security strategy, defense strategy, and nuclear posture review, basically nuclear uh, strategy of the United States. Uh, My basic thesis is that those uh, three documents, uh, what I called uh, in some uh, new American doctrine, represents a really significant shift in U.S. strategy thinking and policy making. Uh, first, after. It is the first case after 9-11 that in the center of gravity is not terrorism anymore, but a competition of powers. Uh, four, or four of those powers uh, enabled uh, like uh, competitors or adversaries are competitors with revisionistic aims. So the four main adversaries of the United States, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, are in the center of attention of US uh, policymakers, uh, uh, military planners, and strategists. Uh, not terrorism, even though terrorism still possess very uh, very important role. Uh, then the uh, United States is declaring uh, that it will handle uh, uh, different security issues and it will deal with the adversaries from position of strength. Uh, Position of strength, and at the same time, they are declaring that the time or uh, a strategy of engagement, engaging the rivals, is over because it failed. This is another remarkable difference from European uh, uh, doctrine, I mean, uh, uh, strategic documents of uh, both main European states and also the strategic concept of NATO. So United States saying uh, engagement is over, it means you can uh, even negotiate with the adversary, but after you either defeat the adversary or you bring the adversary to inevitable conclusion that it cannot compete with you. This means position of, uh, uh, handling from position of strength. I might uh, come uh, later on uh, to elaborate more on this phenomenon, but um, another significant element of the American doctrine and also difference uh, from, from European one is that the uh, United States uh, does not see military force just as an instrument of urgent crisis management, but it attached to the military a significant role in pursuing America's national interests. So the military has a role in promoting United States interests. So this is also a thesis or sentence that you can hardly imagine in, in doctrines in, in European uh, countries. Uh, I do not now want to elaborate whether it is proper, just or something. Uh, from a moral point of view, uh, I just uh, state that there is a, a huge difference. At the same time, though, all these three documents national security strategy, national defense strategy, and nuclear posture review uh, 
clearly says that United States will uh, always try to uh, approach in harmony with its allies and the ally number one is Europe and it always will be so no doubt about uh, 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 North Atlantic Alliance no doubt about who is the main partner for United States is Europe therefore I think we need in Europe more and we need a really frank political debate to what extent this new American doctrine represents opportunity for us or not you have quite a couple of uh, let's say expert analysis on the, on the American doctrine but really profound political debate in Europe in my understanding uh, is missing uh, therefore I, I have chosen this uh, for this uh, for this topic uh, now uh, what is the situation uh, on the other side of the Atlantic like I'm sorry, I need to move here. Situation of NATO and its European members. So first, just very briefly uh, to, to uh, uh, European members and then to NATO, what is really the substance of this uh, presentation. Um, France, for instance, uh, has conducted also as its... Uh, military and defense review uh, this is a document uh, from uh, 2017 if you look at it uh, you will find on uh, more than 100 uh, uh, cases uh, when terrorism is mentioned as a center of, of gravity of, of France so terrorism then uh, uh, you have a uh, uh, part of text devoted to situation in Africa, as you can envisage, and also claiming that uh, France needs to uh, keep its uh, strategic uh, independence uh, or strategic autonomy, if you like, but I mean in French case, not the European case. Uh, that means you do not have any such a uh, strategic shift, like in uh, like in uh, United States case. The same for Germany. You know, Germany has a, a white book from 2016, and then conducted also a defense review. And uh, uh, briefly say, uh, in German case, you will find a concentration on keeping post-war order. Uh, um, German names as a threat uh, the uh, disruptive uh, strategy of, of countries who are uh, put in question the post Cold War order uh, it puts uh, very much emphasis on non-proliferation and so on and so forth um, and even though it envisage increase also the defense budget still you do not have this uh, what I called strategic shift from terrorism to the world where powers are uh, competing. Uh, NATO, what is the situation in, in, in NATO? As I said, uh, you can uh, clearly see that this strategic shift on, European, uh, on, on the US side was a reaction to new situation after 2014 you know, annexation of Crimea and, and Russia declaring its readiness to, to conduct war. Um, NATO. You have a strategic concept. Strategic concept is from 2010, adopted at the Lisbon summit. And strategic concept does not reflect the current situation. Uh, um, strategic concept in its part when it is describing a uh, security environment puts a lot of emphasis on uh, non-proliferation uh, for text of the strategic concept the mere fact of existence of weapons acquisitions of those weapons in several regions and proliferation of, the, uh, of those weapons uh, create a threat mere existence of those weapons 
no matter who possesses them. And there is no, let's say, concentration on the adversary strategy. So, non-proliferation, mm, uh, 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 terrorism and instability are marked in strategic concept as phenomenon influencing the strategic environment. No word about uh, uh, new emerged strategy of the adversary. Because in the United States case, in the first case, the United States is saying it is not only about capabilities. Uh, if we want to prevail, we need to defeat strategy of the adversary. And uh, we need to adjust our defense and deterrence posture according to the strategy on the other side. I will come uh, later on to, to this phenomenon of the strategy. So the strategic concept, for instance, also say that uh, cooperation between NATO and Russia is of strategic importance. Uh, cooperation between NATO and Russia influence the stability in Europe. Uh, no country is regarded as an adversary. So again, uh, text not very much corresponding to the, today's uh, uh, situation. Um, another important uh, text, what we could count into, uh, let's say, doctrine of NATO, is defense and deterrence posture review. So the document that defines how defense and deterrence architecture of, of NATO look like. Again, this document is from 2012. I know there is now discussion about the preparing new document and about changes, but still you have this old document. Uh, to the details of the document, again, I will, uh, I will come up later. NATO prepared in this year, new political guidance. Politi new political guidance is a document that should define a level of ambition of NATO, and it is always at the at very beginning of the uh, 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 planning process. And in also a military, uh, 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 military structures of, of NATO prepared military strategy. But you see, both documents, political guidance, military strategy, both document classified. So I would love for you to, to tell something about the political guidance and military strategy, but it's classified. So certainly this second task of the doctrine, what I mentioned at the beginning, that means messaging, messaging to your own uh, uh, population and messaging to the adversary can be hardly achieved by two documents that are classified. So you will find uh, on, the uh, on the internet, uh, very much about the content of the political guidance from 2006, which set the current level of ambition of NATO, not 2019 yet. Maybe we can uh, expect uh, 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 that NATO will somehow at least partially publish some elements of this, uh, of this two uh, document. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the doctrine, rather old, partially class, uh, classified, but uh, NATO uh, uh, proved its ability to adapt, uh, especially, uh, let's say, in, in terms of military aspect. Last three summits, uh, Wales, Warsaw, and, and Brussels, uh, uh, marked some adjustments of the deterrence posture, command and control, readiness, forward presence. You know that uh, new very high readiness forces was established, VJTF, even uh, uh, much higher uh, ready than the NATO response forces. Then NATO sent troops to Baltic states, which is called enhanced forward presence. NATO adjusted also its command and control structure. So I cannot say that, uh, uh, that, that NATO did not prove any uh, you know, ability to adopt. On contrary, on military aspects, it's working fine. 
doctrinal part is something different and what is also important is uh, that uh, uh, is the pace of the changes that you can achieve within a multilateral organization like NATO is. So you see that now NATO, apart from those changes, is working on, you know, enabling European theater. So it's changing the false posture of its forces in Europe uh, to strengthen security of the European uh, theater. That means to increase mobility uh, of those forces, maybe to change the structure of, uh, of command structure of them, and it concerns all European forces, that, may, uh, that means the VJTF, the most ready forces, NRF forces that should be deployable uh, within 5 or to, to 30 days to the theatre, and also entire other forces, what we call follow-on forces, that would come later on. But, uh, I think it's a very remarkable process, but this process of adjusting the European theatre is planned in three phases. The first concerns VJTF forces up till 2019, should be ready this year. Second phase should include NRF forces. Uh, this uh, phase uh, uh, should be uh, 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 ready, should have outcome 2021. And the entire uh, uh, adjustment of the force posture in Europe should be ready until 2021 and 24. So five years from now. Defense planning, where you, uh, NATO uh, uh, not only plan which capability it will develop, but also uh, it uh, bounds member states to develop those capabilities, have, has similar pace. For instance, Czech Republic commit itself based on NATO uh, defense planning, to have uh, one armored brigade until 2026, 2025 interim and then 2026 full-fledged armored brigade. So this should be ready 2024. Our, for instance, armored brigade is a commitment from the defense planning 2026. All this happening in this situation when the adversary on the other side, and uh, clearly I mean at least for this country and for this region, Russia, uh, very much substantially increased its readiness. Uh, it's estimated that, that uh, in terms of Western military district of Russia, at uh, combat units, uh, can be combat ready within one or two days after they got the order. Within four or three days, they are able to conduct a limited military operation outside the Russian territory, that means Baltic states. In my understanding, the most, uh, let's say, uh, 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 exposed uh, place of NATO to, to the threat is, is Baltic states. So three, four days, they can conduct military operations in Baltic states. Within eight to ten days, they are ready to conduct what is called major joint operation there. So this is the pace that NATO cannot compete with. It is adjusting, as I said, here, but the pace is very slow. Uh, how to solve this puzzle. Uh, and I think um, this is also a challenge uh, uh, for, for, for NATO. If we have time, we can elaborate it because one of the solutions for it is what I called in one of next slice, uh, slices uh, modular, modular approach to, uh, uh, to security. Never mind. Now, uh, the current NATO ambition is that the entire alliance 
should maintain capabilities for collective defense against near-peer competitor, major joint operation plus. That means regular war, regular war with equal uh, adversary, whoever it is. For an entire NATO and should be ready also to conduct concurrently eight less demanding <coughs> missions. Two at major joint operation, major joint operation its scales corresponds uh, uh, for instance to NATO mission in Afghanistan or NATO mission in Kosovo and six smaller joint operation smaller joint operation uh, for instance uh, NATO uh, training mission uh, in Iraq NATO anti-piracy mission and so on and so forth so this is the current level of ambition and it is set by political guidance from 2006. What is a new political guidance 2019? We don't know because it's classified documents. But there are, from what I know, there, there is no uh, major, let's say, uh, change of this uh, current level of ambition. Maybe s some small cha uh, changes. Mati Tetrev, the next speaker, maybe can provide some, some information. But you see, on one hand, as I, what, I, what, I, what I said, uh, a strategic shift, a really strategic shift uh, uh, in the United States and rather, let's say, uh, conservative approach in, uh, uh, in terms of doctrine in NATO and, and, European, uh, and European states. Um, I have next. Uh, I pick up uh, four elements of this new American doctrine and try to elaborate and maybe discuss with you what kind of challenge or chance uh, or, or chance opportunity for NATO uh, it can represent. First, uh, first element of the American doctrine. Peace through strength, what it means. Sanctions used as a tool. Arm sales. You know, arm sales is not only about security, it's not only about earning money, but it has its political meaning too. And of, of course, the, the budget, uh, the defense budget. Um, sanctions. Uh, you certainly noticed that uh, United States now uh, have very m much developed uh, the system of sanctions and they are ready to use uh, this as a either punishment or as a sort of you know deterrence or maybe coercive policy. Who is are we? China, North Korea. But also some Gulf states cooperating with uh, Syrian, <laughs> Syrian regime. Uh, the system of sanctions, first on, uh, in the United States, is very much uh, uh, developed and it is very, uh, very well structured. Uh, it is uh, based on, on, on well functioning cooperation between the Congress and the administration. Uh, so, and uh, uh, the uh, United States sanctions are uh, always interlinked with some political agenda and it is clearly said what is the political agenda behind. So been, for instance now uh, in, in uh, Congress negotiation about new uh, uh, sanctions uh, against Russia, this uh, uh, DASCA too, and it clearly says uh, that uh, it is a reaction uh, on Kremlin's action against democratic institutions, Russian uh, aggression against Ukraine. And as I said, uh, they are well structured because it uh, uh, divides them to two part mandatory, that means set by Congress and you have uh, power of you know, self-implementation. Uh, you have uh, uh, elements of those sanctions like sanctions on the Russian state debts, which prohibit uh, a financial institution to, to buy uh, a, a Russian state bonds, which harden uh, uh, Russia 
the access to uh, to liquidity, to money. Uh, you have sanctions on uh, uh, providing technology to Russian companies in in oil industry. So prior to 2014, you had a lot of U.S. companies cooperating on providing technology to the Russian counterparts in in in, in, in Russia. After the sanctions was introduced, those companies, even the biggest one like Exxon, from one day to another have withdrawn from Russia. Why? Because the United States is a country that is very much based on rule of law and its judiciary system is very strong and no American company would dare to get into conflict with some court in the United States. Uh, this is also very important uh, 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 and, and decision of the court can really do harm to even biggest companies. Um, you have um, sanctions on uh, also uh, LNG export uh, uh, of Russia, so, so basically uh, bans uh, companies cooperating with, uh, with Russia in uh, building up uh, 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 export facilities for, for LNG, liquid, uh, liquefied uh, gas. You have sanctions on 24 uh, 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 FSB officers involved in the Kerch Strait incident. Direct uh, sanctions. Um, you have uh, also part of the, the sanctions uh, 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 on all energy pro projects outside the Russian territory. So theoretically, it can concern any company cooperating with uh, Russia and companies involved in building Nord Stream 2. And then, uh, so these are uh, mandatory, then you have uh, uh, sanctions requiring administrative decision for the implementation. So the, the administration needs to uh, 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 decide. So we have a uh, uh, sectoral sanctions, again, banking system, uh, uh, against shipment after the Kerch Strait, uh, 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 United States introduced sanctions against the Russian shipment uh, uh, industry because of the harm that was done to the uh, freedom of navigation in the Kerch Strait. Freedom of navigation for the United States as a literary state is a very important element, right? Um, then you have some uh, 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 sanctions also against personal uh, persons involved in uh, 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 in corruption in Russia, even. Uh, and what is also important that those sanctions are uh, not only reactive one, but they are always connected with active measures. Uh, so, for instance, part of the uh, sanction leg legislation in the United States, you have creation of. Russia, uh, a countering Russia influence fund that should help those countries expose the Russian threat. You have a uh, uh, certain amount of money given to support of civil society in Russia because it's uh, about resilience, you know, flourishing civil society and so on and so forth. So uh, you have creation of national fusion center to respond to the hybrid threats. So you have also active measures, not only uh, punitive measures in, in sanctions. Again, question for Europe, is Europe ready to follow on this path? You know, you, Europe has also uh, a mechanism to introduce <coughs> sanctions, but first it's rather slow, uh, not that flexible, not that well uh, structured one, and uh, uh, Europe has very long tradition from uh, 20s and 30s when the first uh, uh, sanctions were, were adopted against Italy in uh, the uh, uh, military uh, campaign in Africa. It has a tradition of breaching <laughs> uh, the rules in terms of sanctions. This is also uh, a difference uh, because, as, as I said, the judiciary system uh, uh, in Europe, you have no center and such a powerful judiciary system like, like in the United States. Uh, as I said, it is an offer. 
it, it can be a, a chance for Europe, uh, for European part of NATO, for instance, because it uh, has proven that it is very, uh, let's say, efficient tool of the international policy. Now there is a debate, for instance, uh, about the cooperation between NATO and EU. So you can uh, even imagine, and, and, and the matter is also discussed, whether uh, you can have some system, for instance, that NATO, that has very well developed threat assessment, the NATO structures would uh, name or mark some situation as a, let's say, strategic threat, being a, I don't know, incident in Kerch, or incident close to uh, Finland or Sweden, intimidation of their vessels on, or, or air. And this situation, the NATO marked this situation as a strategic threat, would trigger EU sanctions. I know it uh, 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 looks like very, let's say, remote from the reality, but if we have, you know, uh, uh, a lot of NATO EU meetings and trying to figure out what could be content uh, of the cooperation between EU and NATO. Then, for instance, combining NATO threat assessment and European Union economic power can be one of, can be one of the solutions. But as I said, it's open question. Uh, never mind, uh, debated. Um, I will uh, just go quickly. Arms sales, as, as I uh, as I said. Um, it has also political meaning. So, uh, for instance, if you, if you look in, in case of, uh, of Egypt, uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, it, it looked like that the United States are losing Egypt and Egypt is tending to, to more cooperate with Russia in terms of arms sales. So Russia provided a lot of you know, arms to, to the Egypt. Then it triggered uh, the US reaction that it opened up new let's say, a uh, credit line for, for arms selling to, to Egypt in order to have it in, in, uh, in own board. I know it's a very sensitive one, even in, in Europe, to use arms sales uh, as a sort of political tool is very sensitive and, and uh, uh, almost it's non-topic, non non-thema. But what is, interest, what is interested that individual European countries like Germany, even though it's very sensitive for them, France and Great Britain, in last couple of, I have some figure here, but last couple of years, substantially increased its arms sales. So on one hand, in the doctrine, NATO doctrine or national doctrines, you see non-proliferation, reduction, uh, 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 control system, on the other hand, European individual countries increase substantially uh, sales of arms. But another, as I said, uh, topic for the debate, to what extent it can be used um, as a political tool. Budget, I will rather skip uh, uh, at, uh, next. Uh, as I said, uh, United States is changing its uh, nuclear doctrine and declaratory policy that expands nuclear deterrence. Um, as I said at the beginning, in national security strategy and defense strategy, uh, Russia, uh, United States, sorry, the United States say it is about defeating the adversary strategy. Uh, and you need to adjust your own strategy and your own, let's say, architecture, deterrence architecture, according to the uh, existing strategy on the other side. Um, two or three months ago, uh, there was a visit of Ben Hodges here in Prague. Ben Hodges was a uh, uh, supreme commander of U.S. forces to uh, to Europe, it's retired general, and he he uh, uh, provide a quite good lesson and and and, and also uh, interview to to newspapers, so you can find it. And he said that uh, he studied the case of uh, wars, 
during the whole period of the, of the Cold War and the kind of warfare uh, and putting himself the question why we succeeded with Soviet Union, why we defeated and why we prevailed in, uh, in Cold War. Uh, studied cases of uh, you know, Korean War, then uh, confrontation in third countries like Afghanistan. Um, and he said it clearly showed that it is not only about capability, it is about strategy. The United States had a better strategy military and, and security strategy than, than Russia. For instance, uh, uh, a strategy uh, uh, that enabled to direct transmit uh, experience from combat field up to the uh, 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 politis political decision uh, making level. So even let's say ordinary commanders were not ashamed to uh, provide criticism on the tactics uh, or make hints and it was transferred up to the uh, let's say political uh, uh, decision-making level in the United States. This was one of the elements. You cannot, uh, you can't imagine such kind of system of Soviet Union army that is very well let's say uh, uh, based on hierarchy and really obeying the rules. So the, the officers in the battlefield are not encouraged to show their own creativity and providing their own hints and advice to their, uh, let's say, generals, right? Uh, this is one of the parts, but uh, never mind. They said, uh, uh, we have a new military strategy on the other side and we need to adjust uh, what is uh, and uh, it leads to really uh, very much diverging text of the American nuclear posture review and still alliance defense and deterrence posture review from 2012 what is the strategy uh, Russia now in its uh, let's say doctrine uh, you can you can learn uh, Russia uh, uh, strategy or, or doctrine only by applying comprehensive uh, uh, approach to means to analyze capabilities to analyze uh, uh, doctrinal documents but to analyze also uh, their uh, statements of their political elite uh, and what is clear now that, that, uh, that Russia, for instance, uh, is combining uh, uh, defensive and offensive posture. So uh, the, the limit between offensive and defensive strategy is blurring. Um, in case of, let's take case of uh, Baltic states. Um, Russia has developed uh, one of uh, uh, the most striking capabilities and also strategy for the West, which is called anti-access area denial, A2AD is abbreviation, A2AD capability. That means that you cover the airspace with anti uh, uh, ballistic missile system, anti-air uh, system with uh, electronic warfare. So that will prohibit the, your, your enemy to gain air superiority, um, which is very important for NATO, because NATO since Cold War had this basic tactic to gain air superiority and then to fight. Because it know, known, has known uh, during the Cold War that on the other side there is vast conventional uh, superiority. So it invested a lot of in, in the uh, Air Force. And now, what Russia uh, 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 plans for case of attack on, let's say, Baltic states? After the attack, so we speak about terror, but you know, so I don't want to elaborate 
but the probability of this scenario is 1%, 2%, 3%, 0.5% or 10%. Um, you need to, if, if strategy is there, you need to adjust and you need, you need to plan and you know, prepare for it. So in case of uh, attack on uh, Baltic states, and there was a calculation uh, three years ago, maybe changed now, uh, three years ago there was a, a calculation that it would take Russia 60 hours, 60 hours to occupy all territory of these three Baltic states. As I said, this is a pace that NATO cannot compete with. So NATO has already now, so uh, okay, uh, again, uh, I will provide room for, for a question. Um, NATO has some battalions there that would not be enabled to stop uh, uh, you know, the, the rolling uh, uh, Russian forces. So it will be occupied within 60 hours and then NATO would face the situation that needs, you know, after invocation of the article number five, it needs to liberate those free countries because they are members of the, of the, of the alliance. No doubt that in this conflict NATO would prevail. No doubt about that, you know. Uh, but problem is the time. So after Russia, uh, let's say, occupied those three countries, it would stretch this A to AD, anti-access area denial, umbrella above the Baltic states, you know, the anti-missile system, uh, air defense, electronic warfare, and this umbrella aims is that the liberation operation of NATO would be very costly in terms of lives, money, and everything. Uh, this is first part of, of, of the strategy. And the second, very important for uh, nuclear planning, is that Russia has now uh, uh, really a huge variety of rather small tactical nuclear weapons on vast array of delivery system and this is the problem for the West this is the problem for the United States and I think this is this was one of the main driving force for withdrawal from INF treaty so Russia has this sort of you know tiny nuclear <coughs> weapons with very low yields it has uh, even nuclear uh, torpedoes it has nuclear depth charges, it has uh, nuclear uh, uh, surface-to-air uh, missiles. It even developed uh, something like a, a nuclear underwater drone. Very limited yield means that in case of the liberation operation started and Russia will sooner or later be defeated by the vast superiority of NATO. It can conduct what is called de-escalatory strike. So very limited nuclear strike. One missile hitting uh, NATO aircraft or vessels. Very limited one. You can hit the, miss, uh, the vessel or the aircraft by conventional missiles. You do not need nuclear, but you will use nuclear deliberately because you know then you open up Pandora's box in the West. What should then Western leadership, political leadership do? You know, normal uh, logic would tell you, you retaliate the same way with nuclear weapon. But first, uh, is uh, Western public ready to accept this? Is Western public ready to accept nuclear exchange? Rather not. And this is different from Russia. So they have the advantages that they do not need to care about the public opinion meaning first and second uh, United States is now missing this uh, 
variety of tactical nuclear weapons. So there is a gap between the United States and Russia. The United States does not have such a variety of, let's say, small tactical nuclear weapons. It has gravity bombs, even deployed in, in Europe, but not so such a, such a variety. That means, in case of situation when really you decide to retaliate uh, 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 nuclear way, to go the risk, what kind of weapon you will use? Certainly you will not use your strategic weapon, that is United States, France and, and, and Great Britain, that is capable of killing you know, dozens and dozens, uh, thousands of, of people. 100. You will not go for this retaliation. You do not have a adjusted small uh, nuclear weapon. And you are in the situation that either you decide for nuclear inferno, right? Or you will not decide for it and you will accept uh, the offer on the other side to negotiate. And this is strategy of Russia. To show that even started military uh, operation still has political solution. So you have forces in Baltic states, you have A2A, A2A, A2AD bubble, you have limited nuclear strike, and then still you will offer to the West, okay guys, let's come to some some, so, some political solution, like in case of Georgia, if you remember, the six-point plan. And this is, this is actually the, the strategy uh, of Russia. And therefore, I think the United States uh, clearly says that it needs to uh, adjust the nuclear doctrine, combine uh, conventional deterrence, nuclear deterrence, and in the reality, uh, when you read uh, this NPR from 2018, you could already envisage that uh, INF Treaty future is gone, right? Because you need to develop the weapons. And you do have no illusion that, that Russia would stop, you know, to deliver those uh, missiles that are breaching the INF Treaty. Last two sentences and then I give you floor. So this is the this is case uh, NPR, you can read it. It's a very interesting document. It's not only a technical one, it's about a uh, uh, strategy. What is the situation in NATO? Defense and deterrence post review. Document from 2012, which does not reflect the current situation at all. Uh, uh, defense and deterrence post review says that uh, ultimate security uh, of NATO is safeguarded by strategic nuclear weapons of the United States and independent strategic arsenal of France and uh, Great Britain. When it speaks about uh, tactical nuclear weapons, not strategic ones, you know, capable of killing dozens of thousands. Uh, those strategic weapons, which is this gravity bomb, <coughs> with very low yield, it refers to those weapons only in connection with arms control and further reduction. So uh, these are regarded as, just as a tool, as a bargaining chip with Russia to go further reduction. We achieved START treaty, that means uh, 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 limitation of the, of the uh, strategic arms. We need to further uh, achieve reduction of those tactical nuclear weapons placed in territory of five European states and on, 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 on Russian territory. So it does not attach any, let's say, military or strategic role to those weapons, only it takes them uh, as a you know, subject to uh, arms control negotiations with Russia in a situation where it's clear that Russia has no incentive to, to, reduct, uh, to, to reduce 
its uh, tactical arsenal. It says also that uh, NATO will, uh, will cooperate with <coughs> Russia on uh, anti-ballistic missile system. So from today's perspective, it's completely uh, nonsense. How can you cooperate with Russia working on one common uh, anti-ballistic missile systems? So again, huge gap between uh, the United States uh, and, and, and NATO. And the United States is clearly saying that it will adjust its deterrence architecture and it expects NATO to do the same. Um, question? I actually have two questions. So the first one is you said it, uh, Russia needs about three to four days to take the Baltics. Uh, how long do they actually last before NATO will take it back? Yep. What, what yep. Uh, I can... Uh, if you are interested in, in, in those uh, uh, calculations and predictions, I can uh, advise you to read uh, Rand Corporation. This is a f United States think, think tank uh, directly working uh, uh, with uh, uh, Pentagon, which made uh, this calculation uh, three years ago, and it continues to develop the calculation because the ch situation changed. In this regard, uh, today probably it would not take only 60 hours and it would not be so easy. Why? Because uh, there are th those uh, NATO battalions and also what is very important that all three Baltic states in very consistent manner are really increasing readiness of, of their armed forces. I tell you bluntly, me as a Czech citizen can only envy uh, those Baltic states, how clever their political elites and, and strategics are. So they are really very well uh, uh, proceeding with uh, acquisitions uh, and so on. So their armies are much stronger than, than three years ago. But back to your question. Um, one or two days combat ready, I said. Three, four days, limited operation there. So probably not, not 60 hours, but let's say, even if it takes a week, right? Um, those uh, battalions within the enhanced forward present that are there, you know, that four battalions in three Baltic states in, in, in Poland, they are not ready uh, to stop the invasion, right? And they are not there. If, uh, Actually, the, the uh, uh, probably Russia, f Russian forces would not even attack them. Would rather omit to you know have a combat with them. But never mind. Um, to invoke first NATO need to invoke Article Number Five. It can take I don't know week, two weeks. Uh, uh, how, how long uh, did it take after 9-11? Yeah, but that was a bit... And anyway, anyhow, okay, let's say two days, yeah? Uh, but then the only... Uh, then NATO, what, his, uh, what has NATO in its disposal? Uh, as I said, uh, uh, NATO created uh, VJTF, you know, very high readiness forces. It is 5,000 troops. 5,000 troops, whereas in Western military district of Russia you have 150,000 or something, right? Those 500, uh, 5,000 troops can be there theoretically within, let's say, two, five days. Then only substantial forces that is really already sort of relevant for this kind of contingencies, is NRF forces, you know, NATO response forces, 50,000 troops. But the estimation is, you know, uh, the, the composition uh, are, uh, uh, for NRF is that it should be combat ready within five days. It says five to 30 days. So we don't know whether it will be combat ready within five days or 30 days. Okay, let's take five days. But then, again, you need to deploy them. You need to deploy them to, to, to the Baltic states because they are not there. Uh, a calculation is that it would take at least two weeks 
two weeks before first NRF forces would arriving there. Yes? So this is the situation. So my question is, so in an, in an attack like that, only the units and the forces that are on, on NATO's book, books would be employed. So we're not talking about Germany sending its actual forces to the Baltics. So it could be only NATO approved, NATO uh, accountable units. Um, the thing is that uh, you need uh, to start uh, a combat activity, you need to have also some, some plan, what is called contingency plan. NATO has some contingency plan regarding also Baltics. I don't know about any German contingency plan. So theoretically, why? But, but you know, the, the, uh, the stage of the uh, um, Infrastructure here is what Ben Hodges called terrifying in this country. You can hardly see it, you know, to get even to this hotel, right? You see it. Not only that, uh, the bad uh, stage of the roads, but, uh, com uh, you know, communist rulers, um, they were bastard, but they were not stupid. They know, they have known exactly how to build bridges. So the bridges in the Czech Republic uh, 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 can withstand 40 tons. 40 tons is the weight of the Russian tank. Mm -hmm. The American Abrams has 60, you know, for instance. So you need a lot of investment into the um, uh, um, infrastructure, but maybe because uh, it's uh, some concrete scenario, even very remote. Um, in my understanding, because I, I published also article about this, you know, deterrence posture in Baltic states, you can uh, uh, find it, or I can send you uh, a link. Um, my uh, expectation would be that uh, the scenario that Russia really invade and occupate, I can imagine and conceive in case of, you know, deteriorating internal situation in Russia, you know, and you know, Putin's popularity heavily dropped now, but, uh, uh, you know, but the likelihood is very small, but uh, what I can uh, really imagine and what uh, is not so remote from the reality, I think, is rather that, that Russia would start either provocation vis a -vis Finland or, or Sweden and expose NATO then which way and how to react or it will conduct rather limited, very limited attack on one of those three Baltic states very much under the threshold of invocation article number five and um, you know it is not an accident that after 2008 war in Georgia uh, Russia uh, invested primarily in the readiness of their forces in the readiness they know that on the other on the side west uh, you know NATO is representing you know most powerful nations in terms of economy. It will be always, you know, economic. You can never compete with them. Uh, 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 NATO is able to aggregate 3.4 uh, million soldiers. So clear, in major conflict, Russia will be defeated. Therefore, it needs, it puts very much emphasis on the initially uh, 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 phase of the conflict to cause what they call a, a strategic shock to the adversary, strategic shock, and put their uh, weakness under the challenge. What is the weakness? As I said, rather, you know, uh, population not very much accepting stage of war and even nuclear uh, exchange. So what I can envisage is that, um, and what Russia even trained, 
uh, in Crimea in well before 2014 and what is very, mu very uh, uh, much capable of is you can, in, uh, you can uh, imagine for instance some riots in Narva this is the territory uh, in Estonia inhibited by you know 30% of, of Russian minority <coughs> very easy you can provoke riots in such a riot one so for to say that 13 year old you know uh, 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 girl killed by Estonian radicals you can imagine such kind of continuity and then your elite troops from Pskov, that are right after the border, quickly get in with sort of, you know, punishment mission. One, two days, they are combat ready, so they can achieve some goals, you know, killing hundreds, and then quickly withdraw. This is the situation when even NATO would not be, not only combat ready, but politi political decision not taken. And then you have a situation that NATO members was attacked, but the troops are not anymore there. Russia appealed to the Security Council because it claimed you know, its minority was attacked and the you know, Security Council need to do this. According to the, the Russian doctrine, they have the right to protect their citizens even outside the territory. And then what you have the extreme difficult situation for NATO in terms of political cohesion. I think political cohesion is very crucial and it is a weak point of the alliance. So after this one two attack, clearly Baltic states, Poland, Romania, I hope my country too, will demand, even though some sort of you know reaction, punishment, even after the after it, invocation article number five. Western European countries, what do you say? There are not Russian troops there in the territory anymore. They have withdrawn, and it is a fact that a uh, 13 years old uh, girl was killed by them. So, uh, so rather, let's say, have some negotiation. And I think this case can cause uh, the end of the alliance from a political point of view. So this is what I'm worried about. This is what I'm really worried about, and this scenario is not uh, excluded, I guess. And it is very tempting, very uh, attractive uh, for Russians. So you, you will target political cohesion of it. So you will adjust your rather <coughs> limited... And what is the solution? The question now is, what is the solution? Deterrent. Maybe I will skip a uh, uh, far slide, but deterrence. So you need to have forces that will deter the adversary to conduct uh, military action. And not only that you have to, to have a, a capability, but also you need to persuade the enemy that uh, in such a case you will be ready to take all necessary risks connected with uh, a political decision. This is what, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, your doctrine is very much important because you are messaging uh, your readiness not only in military capability terms but political terms. Uh, so if you, for instance, in this MPR, United States is um, declaring that it is ready to limited nuclear exchange, you can imagine how much criticism this sentence caused among, let's say, German military experts community. You know, it is declaring readiness to limited nuclear exchange. But, because the strategy on the other side is there, as the, 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 the escalatory strike, then this declaration of your readiness is not, let's say, uh, lowering the nuclear threshold. It's not extending the uh, you know, cases when you will use the nuclear weapons. On the other 
hand. On the contrary, it increases nuclear threshold. Why? Because your enemy knows that maybe it will not pay off. There is no use to even risk limited, uh, limited nuclear uh, attack because you are ready for this exchange. So you are uh, really, mm, y y you need to make sure that your enemy will not underestimate you. And what I'm saying that from reading the doctrines of European states or even current strategic concept, your enemy will not read too much about your political resolve. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, if you are not ready, then this is rather, you know, lowering the nuclear threshold. So you need to arm, you need to have a enough def deterrence in order not to have to fight. And this is the solution in, in Baltic states, so I, uh, it would uh, take uh, too much time, so m you can maybe read my article. My argumentation is that we need more deterrence in the Baltic states. What we have there now is not enough. Okay, question? So, yeah, the nuclear first use is the failure of deterrence, and the second strike ability is the essence of deterrence. And with regards to the Russian deescalatory policy, so the NPR claims that this is the official uh, strategy of the Russian Federation, but uh, there's, a, there's a bit of an issue here because the 2014 Russian nuclear doctrine doesn't have the. Sorry, I, I can. Uh, what, what is. You said that so the second part. So the Russia military doctrine doesn't have the military policy in it, and uh, and furthermore, it has only been used once in a Russian mi Ministry of Defense report in 20, uh, 2003, and it has not it has never been uh, claimed or stated by Russian high-level officials. So, of course, strategies reflect the threat perceptions of the countries, and the U.S. at least part of the U.S. Uh, uh, security establishment believes that this is official doctrine of the uh, Russian Federation, but don't you think that taking this for granted is in itself an escalatory measure? Mm. Because mm. I understand. The NPR is, uh, well, the NPR is in favor of um, expanding the loyal uh, capabilities that the US had, and also uh, pursuing an SLCM option. And, uh, well, the question is if these actions are in fact lowering or mm. In my understanding, lowering. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think, it, yeah, 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 it is a problem. And uh, it's a very, very good question. Uh, uh, yeah, you are right uh, that uh, in uh, the open part, unclassified part of military strategy, this the escalatory strike is not there. Uh, but you have, as I said, you can learn the intentions uh, of, of Russia uh, in comprehensive manner. It's not that uh, easy discipline, you know. Uh, it combines open sources, intelligence sources, and so on. You need to follow the discussion, let's say, discussion of Russian strategies. It's very hardly to come to really proper places where, where the strategy is discussed. But you have some, you know... Uh, uh, hints, uh, expression of not only political leadership but, but military strategies that, that this strategy is there. But as I said, uh, uh, it is not written uh, uh, openly in the, in, the, in the military doctrine, but what is there clearly is the arsenal, what I mentioned to you, that the, they have thousands of very low yield limited tactical nuclear weapons on a vast array of delivery system. Uh, uh, submarine launched, sea launched, uh, le uh, you know, land base launched, uh, air to surface and so on. Uh, with uh, 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 yield of 1000 subkilotons, it's very tiny. And the arsenal is there. The arsenal is not there on the, on the other side, on the United States side. In my I assume, I take it uh, uh, as my opinion and, and my theory, is that um, you know this, let's say, capability gap in terms of nuclear weapons 
is there between the United States and Russia? Clear. Russia is very much advantage in those assets. Uh, I think after 2009, when uh, President Obama, here in this country, in Prague, declared his, his uh, vision of uh, war without nuclear weapons. It is a nice vision, yes? After that, he, he got also even, you know, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Okay, deserved. But uh, it is a good question. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to, to, uh, to put it into the question. Then, what it means for the United States administration. This uh, administration needs to work to, let's say, uh, be able to prove to the public and to the president that it followed his vision and did something. And in my assuming, uh, after you know, this vision was declared by the president, American administration put a lot of emphasis and a lot of efforts on negotiating a new START treaty, you know, and it costed a lot of energy, not only negotiate the treaty, but negotiate all the control mechanism connected to this uh, uh, new START treaty that concerns not the tactical nuclear weapons, but just the strategic one, right? One missile, uh, you know, 100,000 uh, <laughs> victims. No one would dare to, to do this. But it's there. So, and I, I think it costed a lot of effort. And uh, I know I observed some, you know, rounds of verification of this treaty. And it's really a huge agenda. And I think the United States, in, within those years, from 2010, 2009, 2010, up until now, maybe uh, 2014, underestimated the category of tactical nuclear weapons. And therefore, the capability gap is there. Uh, and, yeah, okay. But if you, well, you said these tendencies are lowering the nuclear threshold, and you also said that you want to increase deterrence, and thereby decreasing uh, crisis stability, Increasing crisis stability, crisis stability so that uh, uh, the environment will not be conducive to an increased change. So, then what steps should be taken to achieve an increased deterrence posture if the threshold is being lowered by lowering options? Because these are contradictory tendencies. Um, I suggest we can, uh, we can have this discussion after the present. It's, it's a very interesting one, yeah. Very interesting one, uh, 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 and not that easy, right? But as I said, uh, they are they saying that they will somehow um, uh, go for more uh, uh, connection and interlinkage between the uh, conventional deterrence and 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 uh, a nuclear one. So first, first of course, most important or. It is the co conventional deterrence, right? So what can deter the adversary? And uh, it uh, is connected with how you perceive the adversary, whether you have a rational adversary or not. For instance, if, you, if your adversary, let's say, is a jihadist that counts with death, that is not afraid of death, how can you deter? So, for instance, uh, very interesting... Uh, stuff you would find uh, in case of you know Israeli uh, nuclear planners because they are facing the situation how to deter uh, the jihadists it's a completely different story Russia to some extent is still let's say rational state and leadership rational to some extent but even you would find uh, expression of Mr. Putin on the uh, so-called Valdai, Valdai Club and he said it was I don't know February March he said openly we will have nuclear exchange. We both will be death. But I will go to heaven. You will go to the hell. You have this expression. This sort of, you know, similar expression to a jihadist. So how you can deter this person? Even though there is some rationality uh, and, and you need to count, uh, take into account. But even uh, conventional deterrence... Uh, for, uh, uh, um, as I said, it is an interesting uh, question, but it would uh, take uh, a long. So we can continue or, or exchange that.
group. Um, doesn't Kaliningrad, already, already to an extent, provide Russians a sort of aid, aid to AD over the Baltic states and any NATO approaches through that area? And secondly, if we were to increase conventional presence in the Baltics, doesn't the Slovakia gap mean that those will still struggle to get through and that those forces may be there, may be isolated, but just make the resistance there longer, but still an inevitable Russian takeover? And the mm -hmm. fact is that as long as Kaliningrad and that area where NATO that the rail guard, the rail course changes so that we can't even move heavy tanks. Yep. Is it is it possible to actually retake it at any time without kind of just suffering really bad losses in that area? Without suffering losses, not. Well, uh, uh, so you need to uh, make sure that this. Uh, uh, you, you need to make some precautions that will uh, uh, lower your, your, your losses. Uh, I, will, I have actually this phenomenon later in, in my presentation, but I'm afraid that Peter is not here. So I will just uh, go very quickly and then come up to, uh, come up to your uh, question, uh, because this topic is uh, addressed in my, uh, in my presentation. So uh, ciao uh, now. Uh, just jump. Uh, U.S. skepticism ag against arms control. Again, uh, United States is openly uh, declaring that it, it has no illusion whatsoever about the uh, 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 next <coughs> perspective of the uh, arms control with, with Russia. Uh, um, in my case also, uh, Russia showed that it, 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 it used this arms control uh, uh, agenda uh, just uh, mainly to entrench its uh, uh, military uh, advantage in, uh, in cer certain regions. Uh, um, anyway, we have no, no time, but, but uh, uh, arms control and, uh, and disarmament still central point, uh, both in uh, uh, NATO documents as well as uh, European countries' uh, uh, documents. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, again, huge difference. And the great power competition, not tourism, uh, in primary focus. This is what I mentioned. So I, I'll give you one, uh, for instance, one uh, example. Um, what it means. And I said, I put the question, is NATO ready to align with the US in this great power competition? Uh, if the United States says that uh, Great power competition is decisive element, not a tourist. It has uh, implication for their strategy, for instance, in the Middle East. Middle East, you know that uh, its meaning as a source of energy is still there, but heavily decreased for the United States, you know, after this shale gas and shale oil revolution in the United States. It is uh, still based for, for, for tourism, no doubt about that. But uh, Middle East is also a place of uh, this big power game. United States, <coughs> Russia, China as an emerging player there. And uh, so uh, if NATO uh, has actually three main tasks, as you know, collective defense, crisis management, uh, crisis management and uh, cooperative, uh, uh, cooperative uh, security. Uh, let's leave now uh, collective defense, but uh, crisis management, crisis management case of uh, uh, Afghanistan. So NATO going, uh, you know, beyond its uh, area, uh, helping uh, those his allies, the United States, uh, with uh, uh, anti-terrorist mission or it has now anti-piracy mission. Okay, fine, but it is NATO also ready to go beyond its area in this great power competition with the United States or not? Question. Um, what is now discussed in, uh, in the United States, it is a case of uh, what is called uh, offshore balancing. 
uh, offshore balancing, uh, and I think it will uh, increase in the U.S. strategic thinking, means that uh, you are not arguing for doing less, why you should do less worldwide, but how could you do less more wisely? So uh, when I read this doctrine, I think there is nothing about American agileism or withdrawal from the global scene. You know, there's a lot of debate that United States will withdraw. No, it will not withdraw because it said it needs to be present on the globe. Uh, it needs to promote their interests. But how to do that in the situation that you are overstretched militarily and budgetary wise? One of the solutions is. Uh, um, this offshore balancing, and we saw, I think, application of this concept uh, uh, in Syria. Uh, Peter, uh, five more minutes, it's okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for instance, Syria, uh, 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 you notice the debates, uh, the United States is withdrawing from Syria, yet Trump is withdrawing from Syria very quickly, we are not prepared for that, it will cause uh, uh, security vacuum, it will enable Russians to stabilize their, their gains there and, and, and the regime uh, and Assad regime and so on and so forth. The same with Afghanistan. But I, I think what uh, uh, is the reality that the United States uh, is not withdrawing from Syria. It's just applying the new system of offshore balancing. Uh, in case of Syria, it means that you will leave some number of troops there, 400 in case of Syria, so the special forces, adversary role, and also those who will help with targeting in case you need targeting, right? So 400 troops, decent level, that train someone who will partially do the job instead of you. This is a very crucial point. Who is in case of Syria? Kurds, right? Syrian Kurds. United States trained them, provided them with weapons, uh, created uh, safe zones for them, even negotiated those safe zones with Turkey, even though, you know, officially Turkey <laughs> is the enemy number one of Kurds. So you will uh, make sure that you have uh, specialists there in the country. You have safe zones, that means zones where the regime, Assad regime, because probably it will stay, has no access. If it has access, then you start. Right. Uh, you will create a non-fly zones. Uh, uh, you will control part of the borders in our uh, arms smuggling and you threaten to introduce sanctions against any country in the Gulf that will be cooperating with Assad regime. Very strong, uh, uh, let's say, uh, deterrence. And you need to have strong naval force there. Close there, strong navy, naval assets, vessels that you can use for kinetic operation in case you need. Either missiles, missile attack, or as a you know base for you know, marines and, and so on and so forth. Uh, no doubt that uh, I think the United States will, in more and more cases, use this offshore, st uh, uh, offshore uh, strategy. If you analyze the U.S. budget, uh, then the uh, uh, biggest amount of money goes to Navy, not land forces, not air forces. Navy. Uh, NATO. Is NATO ready to adjust uh, its strategy, force posture, to apply 
these tactics. I think this should, we should end up with something also positive. Uh, NATO is aware of it, and the last meeting of the defense ministers uh, of NATO put a lot of emphasis on, uh, on naval assets and, and NATO declaring that it needs to invest more into the Navy uh, because, um, as I said, during the Cold War, the main strategy was always to gain air superiority. But the, to, to, to gain air superiority uh, is not necessarily the solution. Uh, NATO, after the, cold, uh, after the end of Cold War, applied this tactic in, uh, uh, in Kosovo, right? Bombing Serbs. Uh, 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 NATO applied this tactic uh, in Libya, even though conducted only of two, you know, or, uh, several allies. But it showed clearly that uh, even though air campaign is successful, achieve a goal without sending land troops, land forces, uh, is, uh, you, you cannot safeguard uh, uh, and you, you cannot enforce uh, the stability. Uh, if you are overstretched and you have, you've, you have no uh, enough troops, then one of the solutions is, uh, let's say, to, to invest uh, uh, into the Navy and then put burden on locals. In case of Syria, the United States put a burden uh, on Kurds and you can, and maybe I will finish here, you can imagine uh, what uh, will be in the future when, you know, you know overstretched United States say, uh, we need NATO for deterring Russia. Leading US generals are saying, we need NATO for deterring Russia. That means put much responsibility for Europeans themselves to deter Russia, to do the job. If you, and then, if you, NATO, helps us with Russia, it will enable us to, you know, maintain our assets, you know, uh, in Pacific Ocean, Middle East, and so on and so forth. So, I will end up, I'm uh, very much in favor of, uh, you know, First, uh, complementary approach between EU uh, and NATO, and second, for working out new European level of ambition, but within NATO. If Europe is willing to invest in its uh, assets and capabilities, it has good opportunity to do it within NATO, to so strengthen European pillar, but based on, let's say, division of roles between the United States and Europe, and not competition. So this is end of my uh, uh, presentation, but I'm ready to discuss uh, with you also uh, after the finishing of my presentation. Thank you so much, Martin.